Arch Advocate Podcast for Thursday. No baby yet. We're working on it. Hey, speak the truth and live in the truth, in the spirit of truth. What do I mean by that? What does that even mean? What is truth? That, that famous old quote from Pontius Pilate. Do you remember that? Pontius Pilate's sitting there thinking to himself, and he's talking to his wife, and he's like, I can't kill this guy. This guy's done nothing wrong. He's just like this, he's just this sweet Jewish guy who seems to be nice to everybody. These people over here want me to kill him. I don't, I don't know what to do. His wife says, uh, well, this, this says, you know, this, the rumor is this guy's the son of God, that uh, he speaks the truth. And Pontius Pilate says, what is truth? Now, uh, the, the, over the last 2,000 years, you've, you know, the, 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 the take on Pontius Pilate kind of goes back and forth. Either he's just a good guy that was in a bad situation and didn't know what he was doing, or he was, you know, basically the son of perdition himself, right? This demonic guy. And it's like, no, well, like if you listen to the actual words, right? You got to look back at like what Rome was back then. Rome ruled the world and they were polytheistic and they had many different gods. And at the same time, 2,000 years ago, that's when, right around that time when all the great philosophers were, were coming up. All the great philosophers were coming around and, you know, finally Rome had, had created so much wealth and so much power that some people got super rich and they had time to, to just sit and think about stuff. And that's where the philosophers came out of. And that question of like, well, what is truth? That was, that, that was a heavy question on the Romans. They were, they were ruling the world. They were very wealthy. They had a God for every different thing. And so when, when Pontius Pilate asked that question, what is truth? He wasn't being flippant. He wasn't being a jerk. He was, he, what he was saying was, what is truth? What, is, what does that even mean? Right? Like if you want to, if you want to kind of understand just a fragment of his frustration in that moment, just you know, stop your car if you're listening on your ride to work or whatever. Stop what you're doing. Close your eyes and and define truth. And write it down and, and email it to me. <laughs> you know what I mean? You'll struggle. Uh, how do you define something like that? What is truth? Well, I mean, if we can re if we can reverse engineer it, can we start off by saying, well, just don't lie. <laughs> Truth has to be some sort of an opposite of lying. And don't lie. Don't be a liar. Don't live in a lie. I have a friend of mine, a very dear friend of mine, who is a, a Christian. And uh, he and I have different... Uh, he's, my friend is a, um, a Calvinist. I am not a Calvinist, by the way. My friend is a Calvinist. Uh, he's a very dear friend. And one of uh, the things that he struggles with in his life, everybody's got a struggle. Some people struggle with porn, some people struggle with alcohol, some people struggle with gambling, and you know, some people are addicted to anger. Everybody struggles with something. Well, my friend, and he will tell you this if you get to know him, his struggle is lying. He knows it. He knows that that's his, that's his you know, thing that he's, he needs to work out. Right, some people like me. I smoke cigarettes. I'm not happy about that. I'm not proud of it. I don't want. I don't want to be a smoker. The whole reason I started smoking was stupid, and the reason that I keep smoking is stupid. But this is like this is my thing. You know, this is the th one of the things that I, as an individual, have to struggle with. Well, my friend struggles with lying, and at least one of the weapons that he has is that he knows that if he's in a trusted group of Christians that he can say like, this is my thing, I'm a liar. And I don't know why I lie. I don't know why I'll just be mid-sentence and I'll just, start, I'll just start fabricating stuff. I don't know why I do that. I do that. And you know, it's really, uh, you know, it, it's really a hell of a thing to behold. And by the way, he's not the first person I've met that had that affliction. I had another friend many years ago, same thing. He wasn't a Christian though, but he, he, he still, like, he knew that this was like a problem with him. 
And he told me that. And I can't remember the guy's name. I can see his face as I'm talking about him, but I can't remember his name. But he was just really good guy. Super good guy. He was, uh, you know, uh, he, he was a proud father. He was a hard worker. He was a great salesman. But his thing was he lied. He just, and I remember talking with him about it. When he's like, yeah, I just, I don't. And, and the thing that these two men that, that I was friends with, the both of them, the thing that they, had, they both had in common is they both used that same language. Like, I don't know why I do this. I don't have any reason to, I, you know, I've lived a pretty exciting life. You know, I don't, there's really nothing I need to lie about. My life is good enough on its own. You know, I don't need to make stuff up. I just lie. And, it, and I respected both of those men for, for at least having the presence of mind to know, like, this is a thing that happens and I'm not proud of it. And I, I'm not going to sit here and make excuses for it. As a matter of fact, I'm going to tell you, like, I don't know why. I, I, I'm not going to sit here and lie and make up an excuse, right, <laughs> with my affliction of lying. I'm just going to tell you, I don't know. I don't know why I do this. And that's, that's honorable because everybody has something. But when you live in the lie and you allow yourself to live in that place, it's like uh, if you've ever read the book The Hobbit, Right, the first book in the series, it's called The Hobbit. And in The Hobbit, they come to this, uh, this forest called Mirkwood. And in Mirkwood, it's very, it's very dark. It's black. No matter what time of day it is, there's no light in this forest. And Gandalf and this other thing tells, these, tells the hobbits, like, listen, do not even take one step off of the beaten path. When you're in the darkness, when you're in Mirkwood, in the forest of Mirkwood, if you take one step off of the path, you will be lost forever, right? That's what, that's what living in a lie is, right? We live in, in if I can, talk like my name is J.R. Tolkien. We live in three kingdoms, right? There's the kingdom of darkness, there's the kingdom of God, and then there's the kingdom of man, right? Follow me. Now, this is our kingdom, but the other two, the other two kingdoms are always at work. And a kingdom, is, a kingdom is anywhere that the king's rule, you know, the, the Lord's rule is sovereign. Right? God's rule is sovereign. God has sovereignty over us, but God also granted us sovereignty. So we're sovereign over the kingdom of man, right? And darkness, you know, the, the, the rules of darkness are sovereign unto themselves, right? But light always beats darkness and, and you know, the, the place that intersects with God and man, you know, like you can bring the kingdom of man into the kingdom of light or you can bring the kingdom of man into the kingdom of darkness. But there's always those three kingdoms. You follow me so far? So when you're talking about walking through the darkness, you have to stay on the path. You have to, you have to, you have to stick with what is sure, what is certain, the truth. And if you step off of the truth, you'll be lost. And though it's, it's, uh, you know, it's a powerful metaphor that J.R. Tolkien laid out, but it's, it's, not, it's not entirely accurate. You can always come back to the truth. It's not, it's not easy, though. It's, it's very difficult because once you get stuck in the briar patch of lies, you begin to forget what the truth is. That's the problem. Now, in all of this, uh, these last couple of days and yesterday, I know I did three different episodes of a podcast and I worked all day on it. And, and yes, by the way, I'm aware of how bad the audio sounds. I'm working on that. I need to get a microphone. And I need to get, uh, if you're watching on YouTube, I need to get a, 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 like a green screen sheet or something like that. And then I'm going to have some graphics in the back. I'm working on it. But um, going over what we were going over yesterday, look, I don't like talking about politics. I really, believe it or not, I really don't. 
I like talking about the metaphysical stuff behind it. And what, what we're looking at right now, think about this. All right, keep in mind, don't lie. And don't, because lying is lying to yourself. You lie to somebody else and you are lying to yourself. Before I get into like ex explaining all that, think about it like this. Like in, uh, in Judaism, there are 10 commandments and 613 laws, right? And you skip forward to the Gospels and we find Jesus Christ addressing some of, not all of them, by the way, some of the commandments and some of the laws. It's, it's kind of a mixed bag. So Jesus says, you heard, you, heard, you know, Moses told you don't murder. But I tell you something else. I tell you, don't be angry in your heart without cause, without a good solid reason. Right? Don't be angry at people with, unless, you're, unless you've got a real good reason to be so. Because that's what murder is. And so that, that commandment of thou shalt not murder, it, did, it didn't have anything to do with protecting the other guy. God did not say thou shalt not murder to, to preserve the life of the guy that you want to murder. Je you, you skip forward to what Jesus says, and Jesus says, this law, this commandment, thou shalt not murder, it's about protecting you from being murderous. It was always about you. And then he gets into, you know, um, thou shalt not covet your neighbor's wife, right? And he explains, like, no, no, that, that, that commandment, it didn't have anything to do with your neighbor. It didn't really have anything to do with his wife. It had to do with you and your heart. And every single time, if you go through the Gospels, every time that Jesus addresses either a commandment or a law, the lesson is always, it was every single one of these laws and every single one of these commandments was always about protecting, it's God's protection over you, over your life. And the reason that's kind of profound is that you go back to the Mosaic law and the commandments and we find Moses telling people, he says, and, and, and this is what God says, God says, I want you to take these commandments and these laws and I want you to think about them all the time. I never want you to stop thinking about, I want you to think about this when you're cooking breakfast. I want you to think about this when you're at work. I want you to think about this when you're taking a bath. I want you to think about this all the time. I want you to meditate on this. And why would you need to do that? See, that's one of those, see, this is how, if you want to know my process of how I nerd out on scriptures, that I read scripture until I find something that looks out of place. Something that's weird. And then I'll stop and I'll just nerd out on it. And that's weird. It's like, why would I need to meditate on this? Okay, you know what I mean? Like a commandment, thou shalt not murder. Seems pretty clear. It seems like something I don't really need to think about. Like, okay, God, I get it. Don't kill people. Gotcha. Right? So like if I come over to your house for a barbecue and you say to me, you know, you give me a commandment. You say, hey, Pete. Listen, I need some garlic powder so I can so I can finish making this rub for this brisket. If I don't have the garlic powder, then we're not going to have barbecue. So here is here is my commandment. I need you to drive down to the store and pick up one of those containers of garlic powder. Come right back. Okay, I got it. I understand that commandment. Real simple. I don't need to meditate on it. Gotcha. Don't murder people. Gotcha, Lord. Don't lie to people. Don't bear false witness. Okay, pretty sounds pretty simple, but no. Evidently, it's so complex. It is so complex that God requires that you think about it all the time for the rest of your life. That's how complex God says it is. And that, that the according to Jesus Christ, the Messiah, right? the Word of God made flesh, walked amongst us, According to him, the, the, the correct interpretation of all of these commandments always comes back to these commandments and these laws are about protecting. It is, a, it is an expression of God's protective love over your life. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not lie. Why? 
Because when you lie, you are putting yourself in danger. You're stepping off of the beaten path in, the, in, in forest Mirkwood. Mirkwood Forest, Sherwood Forest. Right? We're walking through the kingdom of darkness and it's all dark. The trees are so thick that no light can get in. There's no light. It's just darkness. And the only thing that you have to rely on is the beaten path, the truth. And if you step out of the truth, you're lost. It's very difficult because the, the, in, in the story, the hobbits actually did step off the path and they made it back. So there's some, you know, thank you, J.R. Tolkien, for giving us some hope uh, that we can make it back, back to the path. But here's, here's what I'm getting at here. You look at when I was talking about politics yesterday and over the last couple of weeks and the Young Turks and everything, my fascination with all of this stuff is the is the the culture of darkness that's happening in America right now. And and I want to give voice to that so that everybody can see what's going on. Anybody who can who can pause for a minute and maybe consider my point of view here is like just look at the darkness and make sure that you do not get entangled in it. Here's, a, here's a, one example of what I'm talking about. Now, when it comes to politicians, right? Like, what are they for? What do they represent? Where, what is their place in our society? Because surely there's a place in our society for politicians. What is it? What is it, right? No, well, it's policy makers and lawmakers and people who are, are, are there to, you know, that we entrust to uh, shape and form our laws so that our society can progress, right? We used to have crazy laws in, in America. That, that Some of them are called, what are called blue laws, and that's just laws that are still on the books, but nobody, you know, everybody understands, like, oh, that's, we can't, you know, we, we don't do that, right? Like, uh, like in Arizona, it's still a law, like, you can't spit on a sidewalk. Don't spit on the sidewalk. Well, why is that a why is that a law? Well, because in the old days, like women wore long dresses that went all the way down to the ground, and America was not rich. People were not rich, and if a lady had a dress, right? Because back then, you like you couldn't even a woman. It was inappropriate for a woman to even show her ankles. So dresses went all the way down to the ground, but at the same time, all the men folk smoked cigars and chewed tobacco and all that sort of thing. And so they'd be walking around on the, on the you know, boardwalk, on the sidewalk, and they'd spit. They'd spit their chew out. And the ladies would go to their husbands and then they'd go to the sheriff or whatever. They'd say, like, look, I don't, I'm not rich, all right? And when I'm walking down the street with my, with my dress flowing and I, and I drag my dress through some nasty dude's spit... Like, it stains it, and I, it, I can't get it out. But I do have to scrub and scrub and scrub and scrub, which wears down the fabric, and now I'm out of a dress. I'm not rich. I can't afford this. I can't afford to go buy a new dress. Can you make it a law to not spit on the damn sidewalk where I'm walking, dragging my clothes up and down the, the sidewalk? And so that's where that law comes from. Don't spit on the sidewalk. It had to do with common decency and, and respect for your neighbor and all that other stuff. Why did I just start talking about that? Lawmakers, right, I'm sorry. We have, a, we have a place for them. And so when they enter into the popularity contest of, of campaigning for themselves, it's, they come out and they say, well, listen, this is my position, right? I think that... You know, farm subsidies ought to be this. Like if you're in Kansas or whatever, or if you're in the Central Valley of California or wherever there's farmland, it's like, well, then you're, you know, your politics have to be about farmers and about agriculture and about farm subsidies and about, you know, what's fair as far as pricing and all that other stuff. It's policy. What are, what are your politics? What are the problems that you see? given that you live in this community and you know all the farmers and you, you, know, you hang out with them, you go over to their house and you drink beers and have barbecue and you listen to what they say, you listen for their problems. When you hear farmers talking about like, look, there's gonna be a bumper crop of soybeans this year and I might get screwed on my price. 
If I get screwed on my price, then I'm not going to be able to make my mortgage and pay, pay the loans on the, on the farm equipment that I own. The millions of dollars of farm equipment that I own. And if I, don't, if I can't make those payments, then I lose my farm equipment. And if I lose my farm equipment, then I lose my farm. That's a big problem. So that politician has to go out and say, well, this is the thing that I think is the solution to this problem. Because I've heard 20 different farmers tell me the exact same thing. And so I think here is, here is the political solution to this problem, politics, right? Nothing devious or you know, nefarious about that. And there used to be a time when people were voted in on their politics, good or bad. There were politicians years ago that were saying, you know, well, we think that there should be more free money and welfare for just, you know, for just people who are just mentally broken, not physically, not, you know, they're not, it's not that they're too old or not that they're, you know, confined to wheelchairs, but they're just, they've just given up on life. And we think there ought to be more money for those people. And it's like, okay, I don't agree with that. I think that's a horrifically bad idea. I'll even go so far as to say that's a demonic idea. But that's your politics. And now I get to choose if I want to vote for you or not based on those things. Evidently, that's a thing of the past. Because look at what happened. This is, this is, this is the lie. This is what I, I, I want to address. Voting has become a virtue signaling thing. Yesterday, there was a, a lady, uh, I want to say Kansas, maybe it was Missouri. A lady was voted in, and she is a, uh, she's an Indian, right? Casino, not tech support. She's an Indian, and uh, she's uh, part of the LGBT uh, community, so clams, not sausage, right? And she, she won. Right? She's Native American, she's a lesbian, and she won. And guess what the news is talking about? Oh, this is the first Native American, LGBT, good beat you, uh, this, that, and the other, everything except for what she stands for. It's like, I don't care. I don't care if she's a carpet muncher. Don't care. And I don't care what her national bloodline is. Don't care that she, you know, that she's from a tribe. That has nothing to do, doesn't affect me at all. Even if I lived in her district, doesn't affect me. What are her politics? What does she stand for? What is it that she stood up and said, is, and said look, there's, here's this problem over here, and here's what I think the solution is. And if you vote for me, I will get on a plane and fly to Washington, D.C. and walk into that very important room and I will tell everybody in that room that they need to do what I'm telling them they ought to do on your behalf. None of that. It's just this big festival of all these people. And, and believe me, like this isn't her fault. I, 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 I know literally nothing about this lady other than what I've read uh, in the news. And guess what, guess what the only thing I've read in the news is? She's Native American and she's gay. That's it. That, that, that's all there is. I know nothing about her. She might, she might be the, the most dead-on accurate politician who ever lived, but I'll never know. So what I'm saying is it's, like, it's not her fault. It's the people. I'm not looking at the problem itself. I'm looking at the bigger problem. And the bigger problem is that there's all these American people, American people just like you and me, that are out there saying like, oh, isn't it wonderful that this lady won? Oh, why? Is she gonna, is she gonna fix the, the drought? Right? I, I, listen, I don't know what the problems of Kansas are. Right? Is she going to fix this, that, or this? She, you know, is, was she talking about minimum wage? Was she talking about health care? Was she talking? What is it that she said she was going to fix? Oh, I don't know. That's not important. What's important is is that she's Native American and gay, and, and they're celebrating. That's living in the lie. You have stepped off of the path of truth, and now you're just off in the darkness. What the hell does that have to do with anything? Oh, it shows that we've progressed. Progressed to what? Progressed to not caring about what our politicians stand for, who they are as people? That's not progress. That's regress. 
That's going in the wrong direction. That's stepping off of the path, and now you're off in Mirkwood. And it's dark, and you can't see, and that's why you can't find the path back home. And the only way to find the path back home is to call out to the people who are still on the path. And if you go back and read The Hobbit, like that's, uh, it's, that's a gross oversimplification of what happened in the book. But this is what I'm saying, is that people are out there just like, oh boy, look at me, I voted for a lesbian, aren't I virtuous? It's like, no, that's not virtuous. And this is the problem, is that, if, again, you atheists, you think there's, there's no God-shaped hole in your heart. Just look at modern-day liberals. Why is it that these people who, you know, liberals are people who, who believe in evolution, that it all started with a big bang, and we all, over hundreds of millions of years, we evolved into what there is no God, and God is dead, and la la la. But why is it that these people have such a fervor to show that they are virtuous? What, where does that come from? Why would you need to show virtue? Why do you need to feel and display virtue to such a degree that it's like it's, it, it's on par with like the need to eat, sleep, and reproduce? The need is that severe. You're going to tell me that, like that doesn't come from somewhere? Somewhere metaphysical? Are you kidding me? Look at look at how how like absolutely zealous these people are. They're zealots. Look at me. I voted for the gay Indian lady. Okay, cool. Can you tell me what her politics are? No, cuz it doesn't matter cuz she's gay and she's a lesbian and she's an Indian and she's a she. But also, there's 56 genders, so we're not really sure about that. You see what I'm saying? You stepped off of the path. Now you're in the darkness, and that's what I'm using my voice for. It's not for the people who've, who've been lost. It's not. They're lost, and the only way that they can come back is if they call out. It's you and me. The warning is for you and me. To not step off of the path because it's real easy to do. I've done it. Right? I've done it and I've got horrific stories. Horrific stories of when I stepped off of the path and got lost in Mirkwood. Right? Still affects me to this day. And it's and it's hard. And so when I see those people, like I don't I know I make fun of these people quite a bit, but you know, if you want to know. You know, if I'm being honest, the, the fact is, is like my heart breaks for those people because the likelihood that they're going to make it back to the path is very low. And these people are going to are, are going to get themselves and a lot of other innocent people killed in their uh, aimless hunger for truth and virtue. You look at, you know, the, the news came out. Uh, yesterday, that Jeff Sessions has been fired. I've, you know, got mixed feelings about this. Right? I, uh, I look at Jeff Sessions. I look at his record, and I think I don't really see anything wrong. I think this is a stand-up person who's worked very hard. He made a couple of mistakes. Right? He, uh, you know, the first order of business for him when the president hired him on. As Attorney General, his first order of, of business was to recuse himself uh, from the Mueller investigation. I thought that was a huge mistake. Big mistake. Bad misstep. There's a lot of people that say, well, that's, that's an indication that he's part of the swamp. He's part of the deep state. I don't know. I don't know. I heard his explanation, and I thought, okay, well, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know. But I'm, that sounded really smart. I'm just going to have to take your word for it. He said that he sought out the counsel of a lot of other attorneys and they all said the same thing, like, you must recuse yourself. Okay. I mean, you know, again, I've never went to law school. I've never practiced law. You know what I mean? I have no idea if that's true or not, but the, the answer that you gave me, it sounds like, sounds like you did what I would do, and that's to seek out counsel of qualified people that are able to counsel you on such a subject, and that's what you came up with. 
I still think it was the wrong decision, but that's not the point. What I'm saying is, is, is 48 hours ago, the left was calling Jeff Sessions a racist, old, white, Nazi, racist, Nazi, racist, misogynist, Islamophobe, transphobic, blah, 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 blah. Every, all of the, all of the, the curse words that have now just become platitudes and cliches. Just 48 hours ago. Right? What a difference a day makes. Old Petey can croon. I've been trying to tell you guys this. Old Petey, I can croon. You can believe that. 48 hours ago, the left, Jeff Sessions was a demon according to the left. And now, oh, he's a hero. Oh, he's a wonderful prince. He's a sweet, sweet prince. Thank God for Jeff Sessions. He's one of us now. Okay, well that, that behavior, that flippity floppity, right? That going back and forth, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. And how you do anything is how you do everything. I heard that on Joe Rogan. I thought that was profound because it's, it's, it's a different way of saying a, uh, one of King Solomon's Proverbs. How you do anything is how you do everything. And that's a hard, like when you say those words out loud and you, you reflect on your own life when you think about those words, it's like, ooh, ooh, Pete needs to change his ways, <laughs> right? There's some things that I do that I'm not very diligent on. You guys know that. Like I've been, I've been threatening to release my book, right? I haven't done it. You know why? Because I haven't written it. I haven't written all of it. I'm close, but like I get lazy. You know what I mean? And I get distracted, and I have legitimate distractions. You guys know that. But ultimately, like I'm not gonna sit here and make excuses. The fact is, is like I, I don't do it because I want to be distracted. I want to be lazy. I want, you know what I mean? And how you do anything is how you do everything. And that's a hell of an indictment. That's something where you say those words out loud and look into the mirror when you say those words. Brother, if you can say those words without any pain, I don't I would I would say that you're 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 not living the fulfilled life. Words like that should rub up against you and cause you to, to rethink what you're doing so to further fuel your trajectory into greatness. But that saying, it, it's, it's the original way to say that was, was what King Solomon said. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. And you see this double-mindedness. Jeff Session, he's a demon. He hates marijuana. Marijuana. Pass me my prescription. He hates the marijuana. And uh, he doesn't like the gay folks. And he doesn't like the, the Islam folks. Uh, he's just a demon. He's a, de he's a demonic person. We need to demonize that old white man. That old white man. With his white man privilege. And just a few hours later... Now Jeff Session is a hero to the left. Flippity floppity, flippity floppity. Like you're double-minded. Pick one. I didn't. I I liked Jeff Sessions 48 hours ago. I like him right now. I th I told you this on a different podcast that I thought it was a big mistake that he recused himself, and I still think it's a big mistake. Right? It's it's like it, it, it's getting so bizarre. The, the, the double-mindedness of people in, in America, in the West, you know, in England and in Germany, in the Western world in particular, in the Christian world in particular, it's getting weird. The flip-flopping, the, the, the double-mindedness, the, un, the unsurety, like the, the, the amount of people that you can see, you can visibly see that they're lost in Mirkwood. Like two days ago, Jeff Sessions was a demon from hell, and now he's, he need, you know, we need to call the Vatican and, and turn in the paperwork to apply for sainthood for this guy. It's like, you know, like if you, uh, I, I tried to think of an analogy earlier, 
I don't know if this is a good one or not, but like imagine if you went to uh, a, a new town, right? Um, you moved, you, 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 know, you, you decided to open up your own company or you got a promotion and your company moved, you're whatever, right? You moved to a new town, you don't know anybody. And so you start meeting your neighbors, you know, you move into your house and you see that the neighbors have little kids. And so you bring your kids out and you're like, hey, let's see if we can get our kids to play together. And you start, you know, you start hanging out. The next thing you know, you're barbecuing. Then your neighbors say to you, hey, Todd, uh, why don't you come to, uh, you know, we like you. Why don't you come to our church? I'm going to go to church on Sunday. We'd love to have you. And you say, oh, uh, cool. Well, tell me a little bit about the church. Like, what do you believe? Are you Jehovah's Witnesses? Are you Scientologists? Are you, like, what's your deal? And they say, oh, you know, we're just regular old Protestant Christians. But the reason we want you to come to this church is our pastor is very good looking. He's got a full head of hair. And I would estimate that he probably spends about $300 every 7 to 10 days on his hair. I mean, his hair is immaculate. He's got little frosted tips on the ends, right? He wears very flashy clothes. He wears affliction t-shirts on stage. He wears jeans that he bought them ripped. I mean, this guy is not only he's cool, but he's really good looking. He's really good looking and he's cool. That's why we want you to come to our church. You got to see it, man. And you say, oh, okay. All right. Well, there's technically nothing wrong with any of those things that you said, but how is his preaching? Like, how is, like, what's his theology? What is, like, how, how are his sermons? And then your neighbor says to you, well, be honest with you, his sermons are complete shit. I mean, they're awful. And he just, he doesn't even really read the Bible. He just gets up there and just kind of spitballs it. Kind of like listening to the Arch Advocate podcast. This guy just spitballs everything that he says. You would think like, okay, then that's, that's a problem. <laughs> right? I don't want to go sit for 45 minutes and listen to a theological lecture of, from a guy that his only redeeming quality is that he's, he looks good. That, that's that, that that's not that, that's not what we base our decisions on when we're when we're choosing uh, where to go and, and and commune with our fellow Christians and to, and to sing songs of worship to our God and receive biblical instruction from men and women if you're into that sort of thing that have the time during the week to just sit down and just just go through the Bible and, and put together lessons. You're telling me that like none of those things happen and the only redeeming quality that this person has is that they look the way that you like them to look. Well, that's, that, that's not enough. You're, you're, you're missing a lot. And what's worse is that if you actually were in that ridiculous scenario that I just laid out, you would find yourself unable to speak. Because anybody who would say something like that, it's like, okay, you just said some complete nonsense. There is no point in me pointing out the flaws of your contention. When people say I voted for this lady because she's gay and she's young and she's an Indian and she's LGBTQ, like nothing about what this person is about. You're just describing you voted for her because of the way that she looks and you want her to guide your society, your civilization because of the way that she looks. When somebody says that, it's like, I can't respond to that. There are no sequence of words that I'm going to be able to say that's going to penetrate your, your mind and get into that place where reason exists and, and cause you to wake up. There's, because you, you know what I mean? You, you've just completely demonstrated <laughs> that you're not capable of reason. There's that, the, the, that fella, what, what's his name? Let me, uh, let me pull up yesterday's uh, show notes. Uh, David Hallquist of Vermont. David Hallquist was running for, I believe it was governor. But I made the point like you wouldn't know a David Hallquist because he goes by Christine Hallquist. 
And I mean to tell you, if you look up, if you haven't seen him yet, if you pull up pictures of this fella, you will see he's a manly man. He's got a he's got a manly round face. He's got a manly square jaw. I mean, I can punch pretty hard now, but this dude's got a square jaw. Now, if I think if I had to lay that guy out, I might not be able to do it because it because he clearly does not have a glass jaw. And he's got you know like when you're a man, like you have a beard line. Like no matter how you know how fresh you shave, right? I could pause this. Like you guys see, I got a little, you know, a little stubble. If you're watching on the YouTube, like if I I could go and shave right now and come back, and you would still be able to see my beard line. And this this David Holquist has a beard line. It's like okay, clearly, you are a man who wears a dress. Oh no no, we call it transgender. I don't care what you call it. It is what it is. You're a man. Everybody can see that, and you're wearing a wig, some makeup, and a dress. You're a man. And there's people out there that are like, oh, this would be so great. This would be such a sign of civilization's progress if we, if we just voted in this man who wears a dress. It's like, why, why is that progress? Why do you believe that that's progress? But you can't. Like, you can't a ask those people, like, well, okay. Help me out here, all right? You gotta help me out here. I have some phobias. Like, I'm sick. My doctor says I have arachnophobia, which means I have a medical condition that makes me very fearful of spiders, right? I have agoraphobia, which means I have a doctor's note that says I have a sickness that says I'm afraid of everything, and that's why I never leave my house. But I also have some other phobias, and one of them is transphobia. When I see trans... Oh, here's another one. Did you know that there's an actual medical condition, a medical, like a doctor, like a psychologist can give you this, this diagnosis where... I, and by the way, I've seen it. It's one of the most bizarre things, that there, are, there is a legitimate sickness where people are, are legit scared midgets. Little people, like I've, I, I, I used to work with this lady. She was an older English lady. We were talking about, she, I, I can't remember how we got on the subject, but she was just like, she, when she started describing the fact that she had uh, whatever midget phobia is, like there's an actual like word for it. She started getting very tense. Like just, just speaking about midgets was freaking her out. Like, it's a legitimate thing. So, like, if you talk to somebody and they were like, oh, no, we need to, we need to, we need to elect David Hallquist because this would be a sign that, that mankind is progressing by putting a, a woman, I'm sorry, a man who wears a dress into the governorship of the state of Vermont. And if you said to them, well, listen, here's the thing. I have a, I have a note from my doctor here. I have a sickness. It's called transphobia. And I have to take medication for it, but given the fact that you, you are saying that the, that, that the progress of mankind like rests on this issue, I need you to explain to me as a transphobic person, a person with a sickness, I got a disease, man, it's not my fault. Why is electing a man who wears a dress a, a, uh, a milestone in the in the chronicles of mankind that that mankind has progressed why like why is this helpful and they would say well you're transphobic and you say yeah i know i know i know that's what my doctor says but but go on with your explanation oh my god you're full of hate and contempt it's like yeah i know i'm sick i got a sickness like would you would you would you insult somebody with cancer right for being sick i just told you my doctor said i'm sick I just told you that. No, please go on with your explanation. You're a Nazi. You know what I mean? Like they wouldn't be able to explain it to you. And therefore, like there wouldn't be any, really any reason to try to sit and reason with those people. To, to be like, okay, make your case to me. Why is it important? Why is this lady's sexuality important to the trajectory of whatever district this lady now presides over? 
It's like Ocasio uh, Cortez, right? She's cute, still, right? She's 28, pretty much, you know, everybody's cute when they're 28, or almost. She's cute, you know, she's skinny, whatever. She's from New York, all that sort of thing. But all these people are rejoicing. And, and by the way, like, it, I, I'm listening to both sides here. And it's like when, Repu when conservatives are like, oh, what a shame it is. It's like, dude, nobody else was going to win that district. It was either going to be her. The, the Republican uh, economist was not going to win. Right? It's a very Democrat that that place has been ruled by Democrats for decades. So there wasn't there wasn't a good scenario that was going to happen there. But the thing is, is that people are so they're 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 in need of such uh, uh, virtue. Like they need to have the part of their soul that is that needs virtue. They need to have that itch scratched so bad that they're saying, "Look, we got this cute socialist." Man, she's really, she's really ahead of herself. You know, like she's like, she's a big thinker, man. She's cute. She's young. And people like her, man. She was a bartender. And it's like, okay, okay. All right now, slow down. What are her politics? Oh, she's going to get free stuff from everything. It's like, oh, okay, cool. Can you explain like your, how that works? Uh, who's, who's going to pay for it? Well, the government, okay, okay. But where do, is the government a business? Do, does the government earn money? How does the government get money? From the taxpayer. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? Like, you, like you have to walk them through. But it, you wouldn't be able to do that, is my point. You wouldn't be able to sit down with these people and say, like, oh, listen, there's actually, like, there's, there's things that we've actually figured out so far. And economics is... is uh, one of the things, like, there's things that we know that are absolute facts in economics. And one of those things is that socialism kills everything it touches. And here's the reason why. Right? But the, the, the point I'm making is uh, don't lie to yourself because it's very easy to do. When you see our politicians, like I, I told you guys before, in my district... Where I'm from, where I grew up, where I joined the Marine Corps, like where I first became a registered voter, where I got my driver's license for the first time, you know, like all those things, you know what I mean? Like where I grew up, in the early 1990s, we, we had a congressman named Duncan Hunter, and he was always the congressman, and then when he wasn't the congressman anymore, his son took over, Duncan Hunter. And Duncan Hunter Jr., I think, is now the congressman. He's my congressman. And I voted for his father. Like, I've always been a fan of Duncan Hunter. Because he's a Republican. I've, you know, like, I've, I'm familiar with their politics. And I've always liked him and whatever. But, it's, but there was some news came out that he was blowing money that, that he got from, you know, campaigning and being a politician. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. And then he took that money and blew it on, on extravagant, extravagant vacations, which by itself left, you know, left the door open. It's like, it, you know, it, it, if it would have came out that he blew $300,000 on a trip to Hawaii with his family, but it turned out that he was actually meeting with, you know, like a captain of industry. And the reason why he was taking them to Hawaii and schmoozing with them was to convince them to set up shop uh, in our district, because our district is very industrial. It's uh, East County, San Diego, and we have a lot of manufacturing and whatnot. Like, like if, it, if it just would have been that, I would have said, okay, like I'm not a big fan of that, but I understand. But no, it turned out that he was just going on vacation and that he, he bought a $600 ticket for his kid's bunny. It's at that point Right? It, it literally comes down to the bunny. The bunny, the bunny, oh, I want the bunny. Can anybody name that song? Come on, man. You gotta have kids. You gotta be watching Veggie Tales if you wanna know that song. The bunny. 
that kills it for me. It tells me everything that I need to know. It's like, okay, you're a douchebag. And I don't care what your politics are anymore because now you're, you've, you, you've, you've put that, that one ring to rule them all. It's been on your finger too long and now you're a golem, right? You, you, you got seduced by the power and it weakened you. That's the whole point of that, you know, the story of the ring and, and the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings and all that. Remember that? There's, there's nine realms, there's nine rings, and there's one ring to rule them all. That's what it's about. It's about power. That's what J.R. Tolkien, by the way, that whole series, if you haven't read it in a while, go back and read it again. Read it to your kids. Because the story of the Hobbit and the, and the Lord of the Rings, that whole series, it's all, it, it's a parable that lasts a really long time. Everything in that book is, meta, is a metaphor for life. And, and you know that because you can actually read what J.R. Tolkien wrote about his, his books. J.R. Tolkien was a devout Christian, a theologian, a deep thinker. You know what I mean? Like He, he wrote a lot of other stuff, by the way. And he, him and C.S. Lewis were best friends. In fact, it was J.R. Tolkien that, that, that C.S. Lewis attributes to C.S. Lewis's conversion to Christianity because prior to that he was an atheist and he'll he'll tell you like the whole thing is like the, the, the you know the one ring to rule them all it's about the seduction of power and you think you want it you think you want power but once you find it once you have it and you put that you put that power on you put that ring on and it makes you invisible to everybody else it doesn't strengthen you. It doesn't strengthen you. It weakens you and makes you sick, and makes you horrible and violent and vulgar. That's the story of Gollum. That you know what I mean? Like it's all metaphor, and that 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 you know the uh, Mirkwood Forest. It's like it's the metaphor. It's like listen, we're living in the kingdom of darkness, and we belong to the kingdom of of man. And we're trying to get back to the kingdom of light, but. As it is that we're here, it's the kingdom of darkness. And you go through Mirkwood, right? When things get so dark that the light can't make its way in. But there's even in that place, even in that place of, of, of just absolute darkness, there's still a way to get through it. There's still a way to keep your feet firmly planted in the truth. And that is just keep walking the path and don't step off of it. Don't make excuses for Duncan Hunter, fellow Christians of San Diego. Don't make excuses for him. Now, he just won again, so he gets another four years. But you people in San Diego, you need to go to Duncan Hunter and say, never again. Never again. And you need to find it. You need to figure out a way to, to punish him. And I don't mean corporeally. I mean, you need to let him know, I'm not giving you any more money until, uh, until I see a, a repented heart, until I see an apology for what you've done. Remember that he came out, he came out on TV, Duncan Hunter, after he was accused and he was like, oh, this is all my wife's fault. It's like, oh, don't do that. Don't be Adam in the garden. Well, God, it was actually this woman that you gave me. It's like, ooh, you're going that old school? You're going back to the... Garden of Eden, Duncan Hunter? You know, use that old gem? Ooh, wait. Anyways, stay on the path. Live in the truth. Live in the light. Keep your feet on the path and do not deviate for it. And don't make excuses. Right? When you see things happening, if it's your politician, if it's your pastor, if it's your boss, right? If it's your kids your wife or your husband, don't make excuses. Don't make excuses. Just keep your feet on the path. And if, you're, if your problem, like, that's why I brought up my, my two friends that were liars. It's like, at least they still kept their feet on the path. You know what I mean? They were liars, but they kept their feet on the truth. <laughs> and the truth was, is that they were liars. Isn't that ironic? Like, that's a case of irony, but like, you, you know what I mean? Because if you do that, like my two friends did, like if, if you do that, then there's still hope. 
that you're not going to get lost in the woods of your own lies and your own excuses and the things that we tell ourselves. Be honest. And look in that mirror and, 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 and remind yourself that a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. And if you want to see the finished product of what an unstable man looks like, just go watch an episode of The Young Turks. Turn on CNN or turn on Fox when they're talking about CNN. Or just watch Fox. Like, those people are nuts. Fox News, like, Fox News is dead to me, right? I like Tucker Carlson. I've said that before. I like Tucker Carlson, man. And that's pretty, and Greg Gutfeld, that's it. The rest of those people are dead to me. Sean Hannity, I'll still listen to the radio program, but I'll, never on the TV again or on YouTube. They so badly, you know what I mean? It's all, it's all propaganda, right? Don't, don't make excuses. When you see something wrong, if it's like, if you see something happening that's wrong and it's working in your favor, don't be seduced by that. Don't put on that ring of power and become invisible to everybody else because you have the power now. It's just going to corrupt you and make you sick. And the finished product of that is, is people walking around talking about how virtuous they are for voting for a, a man in a dress. That's the finished product, is that you're just going to turn into the ridiculous man. Right? That's like, that's the, that's the superhero name, the ridiculous man. It's like the, that meme picture of that guy that was standing there saying, this is what, you know, this is what uh, a real feminist looks like. And he's sitting there, he's carrying all those diaper bags. And there's, and the meme underneath it says, I've, I, you know, I've come here to do two things, carry bags and not have sex with anybody. And I'm almost out of bags. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, it's like dude, you're just a ridiculous man. You're ridiculous. And nobody, nobody wants to, you know, nobody's going to remember you. Because you just, you, you just got lost in, in Mirkwood and, and now you're just bumping around in the dark. That's hell. That's hell. And that's the show. Thanks for tuning in. If you want to support the show, go to archadvocate.com. Arch-advocate.com. If you want to become a monthly patron, you can do that there. 10 bucks, 20 bucks a month, whatever you want to do, man. Or if you just want to shovel some dough over on a one-time thing, I need a microphone, I need a green screen, I got a baby coming, I got stuff I got to do, man. All costs money. If you want to do it with PayPal, some people prefer that. If you want to do it on Patreon, some people prefer that. Either way, I appreciate it. And if you actually have an extra microphone for some reason, sitting out in your garage or whatever, you can mail it to me. And if you want my physical address, go on to archadvocate.com. And give me, uh, send me an email, and if I know you and if I trust you, I will send you my home address, and you can mail that to me uh, at uh, horrific personal expense to you. That's it. Thank you so much, and I will talk to you possibly tomorrow. Until then.